Good afternoon. On behalf of my family and the Hillsborough Baptist Church, I want to say our condolences and thank you for being here to support the family as we remember and as we grieve and as we honor the memory of Ruby Doris Morrissey. Tears have a place here today in this strange season where we have to wait for this day. Understand that we still are here to support and love one another, to celebrate her life, and to remember with gratitude who she was. We are still dealing with how final her passing is, and yet we come knowing that she's found, found victory in Jesus Christ, that she was ready to meet God because of her faith in Jesus. We come ready to grieve for our loss, to honor what she meant to us. And the same God through whom Ruby has victory over death is present for us today, for each of you, for those of you joining us uh, in person and for those that are far away and watching this. We know that we can turn to God for comfort and strength and peace. Before we do come to prayer, I just want to share with you from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters, and he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray together. God, the creator and source of all life, we come before you today in need of your sustaining grace and love. As we gather here today, we, we grieve, we mourn, we remember, and we celebrate. We come, Lord, with uh, questions and longings, desires to have one more moment. We carry at the same time that awareness that our lives are, are short no matter how many years we are given. And so we come thanking you that through you we can have life. We come with gratitude for the privilege of knowing Ruby and for the impact she had upon so many. Draw close to us today, God. Give us, give us the assurance of your compassion and your companionship, even in the face of death. We come to you with a mix of feelings and questions and memories all together, and we ask for your blessing and your peace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we'll invite Joyce Kay to share with us that Jesus saves. I'd like you to share what you mentioned to me when you phoned to see if I would sing this. And I guess um, in the end, when Ruby was not speaking that much in the home, she could understand when you'd go visit her, but she wasn't talking that much. And then one day, her daughter was going into the home, and as she walked down the hall, she heard this voice singing at the top of her lungs, Jesus Saves, and it was Ruby. It's one of her favorite hymns, and I'm privileged to, to share this with you today. heard the joyful sound Jesus saves Jesus saves spread the tidings all around Jesus saves Jesus saves bear the news to every land climb the mountains cross the waves onward tis our Lord's command Jesus saves, Jesus saves, wafted on the rolling tide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, tell to sinners far and wide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing you islands of the sea, echo back you ocean Earth shall keep her jubilee. 
Rising above the battle strife, Jesus saves, Jesus saves by his death and endless life. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, shouted brightly through the gloom when the heart for mercy craves. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, give the winds a mighty voice, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, let the nations now rejoice, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, shout salvation full and free. Hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Now, at this time, we're going to invite Carla Leach to come and she's going to share the eulogy. Good afternoon. Um, I just wanted, Uncle Hugh asked me to mention that the reason we don't have flowers and the pictures and all of that was at grandmother's request, uh, up to and including a handwritten note <laughs> left with bishops that she did not want any of those things. So he had just asked me to mention that's why it was. Um, when I was between 10 and 13, grandmother came to visit us in Powell River, BC. And as always on Sunday morning, uh, we were attending Sunday services. And during the singing of the hymn, I remember looking at my grandmother while she was singing the hymn. And it occurred to me in that moment that there would come a day that I would no longer have my grandmother with me. And that day has come. That re revelation has always made me conscious of her presence in my life. And for over 55 years, I have had both the honor and the privilege of addressing her as Graham. When I look back over the years I have known her, two scriptures come most readily to mind when I think of her. The first one is from Psalms 121, verses 1 to 3. I will lift up mine eyes into the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. And Exodus 20, verse 12, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. In my opinion, her life is a testament to both of these scriptures. Graham was born April 3rd, 1923, the second of seven children. I once asked her what it was like for her growing up. She told me life was not always easy, but she very clearly understood what was expected of her as a child. She was taught respect for her parents, the importance of hard work, and always do your best. Talking back was not allowed, and when told to do something, saying I don't want to, it was not a consideration. <laughs> she recalled Saturday was chore day, and her least favorite chore was sc scrubbing the kitchen floor with Aunt Alina. She said there were 16 boards on that floor, eight for me, eight for Helena. I know I counted them. She concluded the story with cleaning meant getting the dirt out from between the boards, just not going over the top. She remembered her parents well with a great deal of love and respect and told me she remembered a happy childhood. Graham often said throughout her life, from the time she was a child, her life's ambition was to be both a wife and mother. She did both of those things and poured all she had into both. Her family 
was her life's work, and I think it would be fair to say mission well accomplished. When I was born, her youngest child was five years old. Therefore, I had the benefit of experiencing many of, Graham, many of her parenting techniques. Graham had a very no-nonsense approach to child rearing. She successfully raised 10 children and subsequently participated in the upbringing of many of her grandchildren. Some of my early memories of her are of her. I remember her always wearing an apron and being rocked on her knee in the rocking chair she kept by the stove. Mealtime at Graham's was always memorable in that there were always many people at the table. I can still hear her saying, if you would forget your feelings, there would be plenty of room for everyone. One time, someone complained to her that their piece of bread was torn. She responded with, be thankful you have it. Children in Ethiopia are starving. I was the dummy in the group that wanted to know where Ethiopia was. <laughs> so not the point she was trying to make. I can still hear her yelling at Uncle Richard for cleaning the partridge on the kitchen floor. He said, what? I put newspaper down. When going to bed at night, Graham's final comments were, and I don't want to hear another word out of you, as told to me by one of my aunts. There are those that would say Graham was very brusque and no nonsense with her children. I would say this to her detractors. I consider myself tough and reasonably resourceful, but I have no degree of confidence in myself that I could do what grandmother did given the same set of circumstances. She once said that sometimes she did not know what she was going to put on the table for all of them to eat, but the Lord always provided. Mom, Uncle Hugh, and Aunt Josephine told me about a Sunday school superintendent, Hal Smith, that came to Graham's one summer. Every morning he would come down, do his reading, and he would pray a blessing over her garden. He prayed that it would be fruitful and provide a bountiful harvest for her and her family. And mom told me it was one of the best gardens she ever had that year. Graham's life is a testament to Psalm 121, and she relied daily on the Lord's provision for her and her family. She raised us with a lot of hard work and the knowledge of a living and loving God. Church on Sundays was not optional, and she daily put her trust in the Lord. Her family was one of her life's work, and she did the best that she could. She once told me when I was going through a rough patch in my life, it's okay to rest, it is okay to cry, but it's not okay to quit. There were times in my life that I know I did not always do my grandmother proud. There were times I knew she was not happy with me. And I knew there were times in my life that I shamed her by my actions and my words. But there was never a time in my life that I doubted her love for me. Graham's love was free and unconditional. She gave it to all her family without fail and beyond measure. With my grandmother in life, you receive back what you put into it. She was respectful of other people's choices, but she did not mind telling you when she thought you were being stupid. <laughs> Actually, there were a few times in my life I can remember her saying to me, I don't remember dropping you on your head. One of those times was when my daughter Shannon was making me watch scrambled, make scrambled eggs. She was about four or five. She looked at me and said, I hope you know you're not doing that right. I knew from the way she started the sentence she had been spending time with her great-grandmother over the summer. I then had to call to New Brunswick to find out from my grandmother exactly what it was I was doing wrong. Once she stopped laughing at me. She said, I would think you would know how to make scrambled eggs by now. I then replied, apparently not. 
After Graham had finished raising all of her children, her father asked her to go to Harvey to help care for her mother. Graham, without hesitation, readily agreed and cared for them both until they went home to be with the Lord, honoring God's command found in Exodus 20, verse 12. Graham taught me many things over the years, not always by what she said, but by, rather by how she lived her life. Work hard. Whatever job you do, do it to the best of your ability. Treat people the way you would like to be treated. Do not judge others. You don't know what their life is like. Be kind. Be considerate. Be a help to others. And most importantly, hold your head up. You have great value. Going forward, I now have to learn to live my life with one, without one of the great stabilizing forces that hold up my life. I will miss her with every breath that I take, but how awesome is it for Graham now? No more sickness, no more pain. She can see and hear properly, and she can sing all she wants in God's heavenly choir. Shortly after the death of Billy Graham, he had been quoted as saying, one day you will hear Billy Graham has died. Don't you believe it? I will be more alive than I am right now. I will have only changed my address. In chapter 14, verses 1 to 3 of the book of John, John tells us after Judas had left to betray Jesus to the authorities of the day, Jesus said this to his 11 remaining disciples. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go now to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there may ye be also. That's what he said, that's what he did. I have no doubt that my grandmother is in the presence of the Lord our God. I am also sure when Jesus came to take my grandmother home, to her heavenly home, one of the first things she heard was, well done, my good and faithful servant. We are not to grieve as if we have no hope. If we put our trust in and accept Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, we will see her again when we all cross over the River Jordan to enter the promised land. How awesome will that day be? In conclusion, I will leave you with an old Israelite blessing. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Grandmother is home with the Lord and she awaits us there. I had originally intended to conclude my remarks there after Graham and Uncle Hugh had set the date for Graham's funeral. I reviewed what I had written and a feeling gnawed at me that somehow the eulogy was incomplete. I spoke to my mother about it and she said, your grandmother is missing, which is true, but there seemed to be something else I could not put my finger on. Shortly thereafter, when I was driving to work, I asked the Lord, what is missing? This is what he put on my heart to say. I personally have lived my life without the Lord, and I live my life now with the Lord, and I can tell you inequivocably, life with the Lord is by far easier. Not to say your problems will disappear, but they will not seem quite so big or insurmountable and you know you will always have the one person in life with you that will never let you down. Therefore, if there is anyone present or within the sound of my voice that does not have a personal relationship with the Lord, I would encourage you to get that sorted out. God has numbered our days, and we know not when the Lord will call us to eternity. I do not see myself as a good Christian, but rather a sinner in need daily of God's redemption, mercy, and grace. 
which God will freely give to all that would ask it of him. The best person to talk about this is my Uncle Hugh. He is a man of God, has great wisdom and understanding, and explains things far better than I am able. Grandmother told me once, when she found out she was expecting Uncle Hugh, she said, I cannot say that I was thrilled at the news of expecting another child, but I can tell you, your Uncle Hugh has been a blessing from the day he was born. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Carla, for sharing. Reading from that Psalm 121, including and then the balance of it, just listen to the promises in this psalm. I lift up my eyes to the hills from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. He kept Ruby. He can keep us all. At this time, we're going to invite Reverend Dean McDonald, Ruby's pastor, to come and share with us. I think I want to say on behalf of the family, Carla, that was outstanding. Where are you? There she is. And uh, it was a complete package. And I feel a little redundant <laughs> because it was so well done. And uh, so I think uh, Grammy would be well proud. And you've represented your family well. So thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I want to express my own personal condolences uh, to the family. Uh, this may be a difficult day, but it's also a good day because we have so much to celebrate from Ruby's life. Sometimes I've been faced with a, a funeral where it was really hard to kind of bring out uh, a lot of things that reflected the Lord in the life of that person, but that was certainly not the case of, uh, of Ruby at all. Her character, her li uh, lifestyle, her faith, uh, so many qualities that uh, we would like to imitate to make them our own. The Apostle Paul, you know, lived his life in such a way that he could say, I urge you to imitate me. I don't really feel I can say that, but Paul could, and I think Ruby could as well. Paul also said in Thessalonians 5 that uh, he and his trustworthy companions sought to make themselves a model for others to follow. And it was Ruby's stated attention to be an example in more ways than one. I actually made a list of her personal qualities. That, that some of mine, I had 20, and so I'm trying to condense it down to about six. Uh, just for your benefit this afternoon. But uh, uh, I think it was quite uh, remarkable when you start thinking and considering her life. But I think you'll agree with my first point. Ruby was resolute. Now, no one word can describe resolute, but it means things like persevering and determined and courageous and committed and dedicated, all part of that package. And she had all of those qualities there. And you could also say a resolute person who's one who stands firm, someone with a strong sense of duty. As you know, and Carla has recounted some of those things, Ruby had uh, much to overwhelm her. Ten children to raise without an income uh, and without much or any of the modern conveniences that we uh, enjoy today. And I think to myself, and you must sometimes think, how on earth did she do it? You know, most people would have collapsed under the strain, and I'm not exaggerating. You know, somebody who, who pretty much is a single parent, functioning as a single parent. Um, but Ruby was an overcomer. And she wrote a letter to one of her daughters who was facing some 
challenges in her own life later on. And let her, Ruby sent this quote. Each woman has an inner strength. Only she can help herself. When a person has achieved spiritual strength, she can do anything she wants. She knew upon whom she could rely. So there it is, loud and clear. Ruby relied on the Lord. Jesus said, in this world you'll have trouble, but take heed, I have overcome the world, John 16. Then we read in 1 John 5, who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So if you want to know the source of Ruby's strength, don't look any further, look to Jesus. There was also something about Ruby's life that commanded respect. I think it's hard for us to really describe all of that, at least for me, all those aspects of it. But she carried that presence of authority in her life. And her life reflected direction and purpose. You knew what she was about and she knew why she was here. And you kind of thought, I better not make any small talk. I know when I went to visit Ruby, I tried to stay away from the uh, trivial. She kind of intimidated me in that sense. And maybe you're the same way. Uh, if you're a person who's resolute, you are also intentional. By the way, I meant to say, uh, one of the grandchildren said, there was absolutely no ambiguity in Ruby's life. Yes meant yes, and no meant no. <laughs> anyway, uh, I would say resolute people are also intentional. Intentional. So intentional has other shades of meaning as well. Someone who's intentional, they're deliberate, they're purposeful, uh, someone who, uh, uh, in the words of one of her, uh, of her mother, chose to honor God by always seeking to do the right thing. That was Ruby. Romans 9, 17 says, I raised you up for this very purpose that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Now, God originally said that to Pharaoh through Moses. But Paul quoted it as well in his letter to the Romans. We won't get to that till chapter 7, Hugh. But anyway, Hugh's uh, leading us in a study of, of Romans, uh, book of Romans. But uh, in the, uh, the book of Romans, uh, he applies it uh, to our lives. And Ruby also knew that it applied to her life. That God has raised us up that we might display his power. And on, an intentional uh, person is also a disciplined person. And boy, was she disciplined. Disciplined in all their ways. Ruby had goals for her life, goals for her family too, goals for each day. Um, this is one of, the things she, one of the things that she said. Do what you dislike first in the day, then you'll have enough energy for the rest of the day. That's a very profound statement if you take a little time to think about it. If you do all the little, the easy things, by the time it comes to do the hard things, you're all done in, and maybe it doesn't get done. You go to bed depressed. So she got that right. In the evening at bedtime, she reviewed her list. She had a list for every day. She reviewed this list, ticked off what she had done, and then even if she didn't get everything done and felt she hadn't had a good day, she realized she did, that a lot was accomplished. And uh, then she made a new list so she could put the head on the pillow and not worry about tomorrow because tomorrow would take care of itself. Another quote from Ruby goes along with this idea. Listen carefully. When you say you don't have enough time, you're insulting God because he gives us enough time to do the things he calls us to do. No wonder her children and grandchildren quickly learned to Never say, I'm bored. <laughs> That's something that Ruby could look after. Well, resonate, intentional. I'd like to add resourceful to this list. Ruby reminds me so much of that noble woman in Proverbs 31 who accomplished an awful lot in her days. Both accomplished much with their lives. Ruby cleaned and washed clothes all by hand and without running water, and somebody had to carry the water to the house from a mile away, think about it. She made and she mended clothes, cooked meals, packed lunches, and uh, she's already had mention of this uh, garden. She taught her children uh, to learn how to hoe and weed and pick berries in season. 
and what a blessed garden it was, as she mentioned. The Lord also gave wisdom to Ruby. And you could hear that coming out from some of the things that Carla shared so clearly. She learned how to budget on probably a very small income. She raised a family, paid her bills, even saved a little bit in an emergency fund and made her regular church donations. Josephine told me that after going to uh, one of these management seminars, she realized that her grandmother had already taught all of that to her. So she was a great, Ruby was a great time manager. I think all who knew Ruby will understand what I mean when I describe her as forthright. Now I know there are rude people and there are outspoken people. That is not the same as forthright. This is what forthright is. It's a person who is open, sincere, and honest. And I wrote, I read this. You use this word in a complimentary way for someone you admire because they show clearly and strongly what they think and feel. That's forthright. It's not being rude. Ruby had, a clear, had clear opinions because she was guided by the scriptures and could base her opinions on scripture references. It'd be hard to win an argument if that's the case. <laughs> she had a, felt a strong responsibility to hold forth the truths which the scriptures uh, teach for our lives and our guidance. Her words were respected because they flowed out of her relationship with God. She listened to God, and she knew when to speak, and she knew when not to speak. Now, here's a little something that Carla told me about. So she told me one day she yawned. And Ruby said, why are you yawning? Carla said, I'm tired. And Ruby said, we're all called to serve. Carla sa said, serve, serve? What does it look like I'm doing? And then Ruby, with a little grin out of the corner of her mouth, said, well, then stop your whining and get on with it. <laughs> That's forthright. The fifth characteristic on my list is engaged. And uh, I appreciate the fact a number of things have said about relationship of the grandchildren and children with her mother. Ruby was a good listener. Maybe, I don't know if you knew that or not. She really was a good listener. And she was interested and concerned about her children, her grandchildren and others. She wanted to know what was going on in their lives. And she would often ask, through Teresa, I think, to find out what was going on. So we'll reveal that she, Teresa was her research agent in some of those ways. But uh, she cared for her children. She read to them each night, prayed with them at bedtime. Uh, she readily welcomed her grandchildren. There was always food, something for them to eat, played games with them like dominoes, and built up a relationship with her grandchildren. And uh, <clears throat> she was proud of her children proud of her grandchildren. But there's a difference between being, pri having, being proud and prideful. She was not prideful. She was proud, which means she honored the Lord in recognizing what he had did in the lives of her children. Pride is you're taking credit for it uh, for yourself. Carla said, if I could be half the grandmother to my children, my grandmother was to me, I would consider my job well done. So Ruby was thankful to God for all the blessings in their lives and in her life. She lived her faith. She lived her life by faith and not by sight. She trusted God to provide, and he did provide. And she had a deep and consistent prayer life. She listened for God's voice and recognized it when she heard it. Hugh was telling me about going to, uh, on his first job at age 15, it was a construction project replacing the bridge at Weldon. And uh, so around noontime, uh, the crane laid a beam, the first beam across the bridge. And Hugh's job was to walk on that narrow beam out to the middle, unhook the chain or hook or whatever, and make it safely back. The only thing is, he wasn't a swimmer either. So it was quite dangerous, doubly dangerous. Anyway, when he got home at supper time, Ruby said to him when he walked in the door, what were you doing at 12 o'clock? And so Hugh, uh, and then she went on to say, I never felt more, a more urgent need to pray for someone in my life. And then Hugh told her about how her prayers 
were answered. She listened and heard the voice of God. I would say the main character trait that I would like to point out, and I think it's the most important, and I think you would agree with me, is her faithfulness. Ruby was a faithful, was a, was a faithful servant of the Lord. And that didn't come around about by accident. Uh, it's, it's already been alluded to her grandmother, Rita, uh, lived out her faith and taught it to her children. And so Ruby was able to imitate what she saw in her own mother's life. And I hope you're imitating what you've seen in your mother's life, in your grandmother's life. Paul said uh, to the Thessalonian believers, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all of the believers. This verse to me just speaks so clearly of Ruby in her life. She was a woman whose life commanded respect. She embraced good habits in her life. She was always in church and supporting her church. In fact, uh, uh, I remember she always sat quite near the front, but uh, she probably couldn't hear anything said after a while, but she still went and she said these words, I am here as an example. Intentionality in her life. She was uh, always early, by the way, 15 minutes early, because she liked to be there, get settled in, calm down, and ready to receive what the Lord had for her that day. It's pretty hard when you rush in uh, to kind of calm your spirit and be able to settle and take things in. And as I already mentioned, she prayed regularly for her children and grandchildren, for missions, and for others. Well, what does God do for faithful people? Does he do anything? You know, it says in uh, Isaiah 60, 21, that they are for the display of my glory. Those of us who know Christ undeservedly will get to wear the robes that Jesus gives and be made in his image and be on display for the glory of his splendor. That's also uh, in another verse from Isaiah. My friends, that's what heaven is all about. Can it get any better than that? To be so much like Jesus that we are on display for the glory of the Lord and enjoying his presence. Well, a gentle reminder, if I might make one here this afternoon. You can't get there without knowing the God that Ruby knew. And you can't get there without surrendering to the Savior that she surrendered to. And you can't get there without depending on, um, as she did, on Jesus for his grace and his mercy in our daily walk with him. And the Bible also gives this clear direction on Isaiah 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him, call on him while he is near. And another verse also tells us he doesn't always linger. You know, there are times that come, you know, the Holy Spirit speaking to you and stirring our hearts. I mean, you kind of know we should respond, but you kind of put it off and then that urging becomes more quiet and maybe hopefully another time comes back again. But it says he does not always linger. So because Ruby was faithful and followed the Lord, God gave her the strength to live a victorious Christian life to his praise and to his glory. And now she is already experiencing that great reward in heaven. Thank you, Lord, for the, your work in and through Ruby's life. We give you praise. Amen. Now invite Michael and Joyce Kay to come as they share the victory we have in Jesus. favorite hymns, Victory in Jesus. I'd like to also say something that uh, on January 27th, Ruby ended her race. Mm. St. Paul talked about running the race and Ruby ran the race to the end and won victory in Jesus. I heard of all those 
story how a savior came from glory how he gave his life on calvary to save a wretch like me i heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning then i repented of my sins and won the victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory Thank you so much, Michael and Joyce. Let's pray together. Our Father God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, most Holy Spirit, you are the giver of all good things. We offer you thanks today for the life and memory of Ruby. We give thanks that her life touched ours and for the difference that is made. We thank you for her strengths, as Dean reminded us. We thank you for the assurance that she is now safe with you, that she now has perfect health and perfect peace and a fullness of joy. God, even as we thank you for the joy of knowing Ruby, we ask you to reach out in this moment and to comfort those who feel her loss the most. Touch us, Lord, with your peace, we pray. Answer our weakness with your strength. Answer despair with hope and grief with comfort. Hear our prayers and meet our needs, we pray, with confidence in Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. This time I'm going to invite you to stand and sing with me as we sing When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called 
up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning, Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share when his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder when the roll up yonder when the roll is called up yonder I'll be there let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun let us talk of all his wondrous love and care then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder 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 I'll be there Amen and amen. And then may God's grace attend you. May God's love surround you. And may the Holy Spirit keep you now and forevermore. Amen.